ครับผมก็วิดีโอเมื่อสักครู่นะครับก็เป็นวิดีโอที่อยากสื่อให้เห็นถึง UTC นะครับเราทำงานร่วมกับนักวิจัยอาจารย์นะครับอย่างไรบ้างนะครับแล้วก็อยากเชื้อเชิญให้ทุกท่านเข้ามาร่วมกันทำงานร่วมกันนะครับเพื่อสร้างนวัตกรรมที่มีคุณค่าต่อเศรษฐกิจและสังคมกันนะครับในลำดับถัดไปนะครับก็จะเป็นหัวข้อ Panel Discussion นะครับในหัวข้อเรื่อง Translational AI Research from University Research to Startup Journey นะครับซึ่งได้รับเกียรติจากวิทยากรนะครับต่างชาติ3ท่านนะครับเดี๋ยวผมจะขออนุญาตแนะนำประวัติของท่านทั้งท่านทั้งสามคนนะครับเริ่มจากท่านที่1น,นะครับดรโยฮานนะครับบาเทเรมีนะครับโอเค Good morning Good morning Good morning Thank you for joining our event So I will start to introduce uh, our speaker uh, I will speak in Thai and then I will uh, do a translation later ครับปัจจุบันดรโยฮานนะครับท่านมีตำแหน่งเป็นเลคเชอร์เลอร์นะครับที่ Smart Infrastructure Facility University of Hong Kong นะครับแล้วก็เป็นลีดเดอร์ในศูนย์ที่ชื่อ Digital Living Lab นะครับท่านสำเร็จการศึกษาระดับปริญญาเอกจาก Applied Mathematics University of n a m e r นะครับ Department of Mathematics นะครับแล้วก็มีความสนใจเรื่องของ Applied AI Computer Vision Intelligence Video Analytics นะครับ Edge Computing and GPU Computing นะครับแล้วก็รวมไปถึงการพัฒนา Intelligent Sensor and Edge Computing Device นะครับสำหรับเรื่อง Application ต่างๆนะครับโดยเฉพาะ Target ไปในการใช้งานในอุตสาหกรรมและก็ Smart City นะครับโอเคทีนี้วิทยากรท่านที่2นะครับมิสเตอร์วิลเลียมลีนะครับปัจจุบันท่านเป็น Associate Director นะครับที่ NUS Advanced Robotics Center นะครับท่านสำเร็จการศึกษาในระดับปริญญาตรีนะครับเกณฑ์ยอดอันดับหนึ่งนะครับ Mechanical and Computing ที่ Monash University นะครับแล้วก็ได้ศึกษาต่อนะครับ American Society of Mechanical Engineers นะครับ New York City นะครับ Post Graduate on Leadership Development Programs นะครับแล้วก็ท่านเองนะครับเป็น Strategic Innovation Policy นะครับ Planning and Management by Bringing Disruptive Technology to Market นะครับ For Venture Creation and New Business with Intelligent Machines Through Digitalization and Digital Transformation นะครับทีท่านสุดท้ายนะครับดรอิติการนะครับคารูเพียตนะครับปัจจุบันท่านเป็นดีเรกเตอร์นะครับแล้วก็เทคโนโลยีสนะครับที่ n v i d i a นะครับสำเร็จการศึกษาระดับ PhD ที่ University of Science จากมาเลเซียนะครับแล้วก็ท่านมีความสนใจเรื่องของ Translational R&D นะครับ to accelerate deep learning machine learning GPU adaptation for n v i d i a customer partner collaborators นะครับ Translational R&D and software solutioning for production use นะครับท่านมีความสนใจแล้วก็มีประสบการณ์อย่างมากในการในเรื่องของ accelerated computing software research นะครับ deep learning design and development activities covering end to end needs นะครับโอเคก็ประวัติทั้ง3ท่านนะครับน่าสนใจทั้งหมดนะครับวันนี้ท่านจะมาแชร์เกี่ยวข้องกับเรื่องของการนำงานวิจัยเอาไปใช้ได้จริงนะครับทั้ง3ท่านอยู่ในกระบวนการเรื่องของการทำ research to innovation ทั้งหมดนะครับเดี๋ยวแต่ละท่านจะเข้ามาแชร์ประสบการณ์ในวันนี้นะครับโอเค so uh, I will start The first questions I will ask uh, all the speaker to uh, give a short introduction about yourself and also your research to innovation journey. So may I start with uh, Dr. Johan? Um, sure. Um, let me share my my screen. I've got some slides to share with you. Sorry, uh, my mistake. Um, right, um, can you see my screen? Yes, Johan can see. Go ahead. Uh, good, thank you. So, uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on which part of the, the world uh, you are watching this. Uh, my name is Johan Barthelemy, and it's a great pleasure um, to be here with you today. So um, as was mentioned uh, by the presenter, I'm a lecturer at the Smart Infrastructure Facility. And over there, I'm leading the Digital Living Lab. And I would like to give you a quick introduction about uh, well, my background and what I've been doing over there. 
So the Digital Living Lab is a research facility inside the University of Wollongong that is all about um, the developing the next generation of smart city application. And uh, we can work in different areas like uh, edge care facilities or air quality or looking at a way to improve the, the safety of, of cities using AI. To do that, I'm working with a team that is uh, very interdisciplinary. So we've got people focusing on AI, we've got electrical engineers for IoT, or we've got other mathematicians working on simulation and modeling. But uh, what we try to take advantage of is um, GPU and edge computing. The, the research center is actually very young. So we are four point years, uh, years young. It will be five years next January. So hopefully we'll still be there. And um, we've been working a lot with the industry and uh, one of the uh, our strongest support uh, since the beginning has been uh, NVIDIA. That's why we focus on edge computing and, and GPU computing. So the Digital Living Lab is really focusing on developing smarter devices to make uh, or to enable smarter decisions. And to do that, we focus on applied intelligent video analytics and the artificial intelligence of, of things. So we are actually uh, actively developing and benchmarking several uh, applications based on those two technologies. And the applications ranges from uh, smart cities, so that's what we focused on at the very beginning. But we also look at uh, environmental monitoring in Antarctica, or we work with many different types of uh, industry, and I'll give you a couple of uh, examples uh, later on. In terms of uh, locations for application, we worked mainly in Australia, of course, that's our garden, but we, we started some collaboration uh, in Vietnam, and also we, we, uh, we are going to, to deploy some nice products in Antarctica to monitor the impact of climate change over there. Um, we are also developing a, a certification process for the, the industry working in the AIoT space, and we are just uh, developing a new testing facility. So we've got something quite unique in Australia and even in the region, which is a climate test chamber for devices, but also a refrigerated uh, wind tunnel. So we can put devices there and uh, tweak the, the climate and check uh, that they can survive. Now, um, our research center, so the Digital Living Lab, even though we are sitting inside a, a university, so we are, um, mostly academics, we are basically doing a lot of commercial research. So we are an interface for the university between researchers and the, the industry. So we do a lot of uh, research translation uh, exercise. And it means that we, we work with industry partners to co-develop some new intellectual properties. Or uh, after we've, we've done a project, uh, we look at how we can actually license it to the partners or even if it's something really good, we try to, to patent it and uh, deploy it all over the world. Another path that uh, we started looking at is also to uh, spin out. So when we've got something very new, very innovative, and there is not really a, a predefined commercial uh, partner, so we, we look at developing our own spin out to put the technology on the market. Um, one of the, the biggest platforms that we've developed is uh, the Viva One. So that's the versatile intelligent video analytics platform, which is all about real time, ethical, versatile, uh, intelligent video analytics for smarter cities. So we are really focusing on something that is privacy compliant and works at the edge and can be used for many different types of applications. It's like a model store that we co-develop with partners and we license to uh, th those industry partners uh, whenever it's possible. Um, just to give you a few examples, so one of the, the current projects is to use, for instance, a garbage truck from uh, utility services and use them as a mobile intelligent video analytics devices. So as you may know, there are a lot of cameras in those trucks that offer the 360 degree uh, field of view around the, the truck. So we can put uh, a small computer in it, like a NVIDIA Jetson Xavier, and try to analyze in real time the video feed coming from the camera to uh, deploy different types of application. The first one is to analyze the content of the beams being emptied into the, the trucks. So the, the driver does not need to focus on that operation anymore, thus improving the safety. So why I'm mentioning this project, it's because it's uh, one that is going through a commercialization process here uh, as well. And um, the very interesting bit about it is that it involves 
two different parties in addition to uh, UW. So we need to work with Wollongong City Council because they're the ones subcontracting um, the, the fleet operator. And we work with Remondis, which actually owns the, the garbage truck. So um, we learned a lot during that process because it took nearly one year to get the contracts done and maybe six months to do the actual research. So that's one of the, the key learning uh, we got there. All the legal phase and legal aspect is quite challenging. Another one that we are uh, really on the verge to commercialize is uh, what we call the smart sign technology. It's a technology that we are developing for the pipeline industry in Australia. And it's all about developing smart camera that you can deploy in the middle of nowhere in Australia to monitor pipelines. So to make sure that if an excavator comes too close to a, a pipeline that is buried, we can detect it and send an alert via satellite or uh, long range uh, communication to the uh, control room of the operator. This is uh, being done in partnerships with Fleet, so that's uh, a startup in the space uh, industry, and the Future Fuel CRC, a consortium of uh, pipeline operators and universities. So for that particular project, uh, we had to, uh, to, to go through the, the road of patenting the, the innovation and have a lot and lot of discussion with the, the different um, uh, parties engaged which means that we learn a lot in that project as well. Um, trust is actually one of the, the key learning from that particular project. Another one um, that we, we are currently working and also being commercialized soon, we hope, is what we call the safety after dark project. So we work transport for New South Wales, the biggest transportation operator in Australia. And um, we also work with Sydney Trends that owns the infrastructure. And we also have the support of NVIDIA for, for that project through the Applied Research Accelerator program. And that's all about developing an AI that we can deploy on the CCTV network to detect in real time some antisocial behavior or some incident that could happen uh, in the train station. So on the platform, so people fighting with each other, someone stalking someone else. So we are, we are currently training that kind of uh, AI and we are testing it on the field. And we are also looking at a uh, scaling that um, uh, solution with transport for resource wells, leading probably to a, a spin out um, in, in the next few months. So that's just a couple of things, but as I mentioned, uh, the Digital Living Lab is an interface between the industry and the researchers. And we've been working, or we are currently working with different um, uh, partners, both in the public and the private sector. So we are working, for instance, with the Australian Defense, but also with Transport for Resource Wales or Austrade for projects overseas. Uh, we worked with different types of small, medium, and big companies and even startups, like uh, Blue Scope, which is the largest uh, steel industry in Australia. We, we worked with um, uh, city councils like Wollongong and uh, some suburbs in Sydney. Uh, worked with some other universities uh, through the Future Fuel CRC and the Securing Antarctica and Environmental Future. So roughly 40 universities when you put all of them together. But we also worked with tech giants like uh, Telstra, so the big telco operator here, NVIDIA and, and Microsoft. And um, we, again, um, working with that many different partners and different sites, we, we learned that there is not a silver bullet when it comes to research translation. Each case is different. And it's sometimes easier to, to start with a startup because well, there's more agility there. But if you look for scalability and, and scale it up, we learned that uh, it's better to go with uh, bigger and, and stronger industries like um, Telstra or Blue Scope. Um, now we, we get a, a lot of experience now, but still with five years uh, behind us. But um, we found out that it's good to, to have actually a consortium around us. So last few months, we, we got the, the funding from the Australian government to build an innovation hub to foster innovation in the region around Wollongong. So we are, we are working with uh, Microsoft, Telstra, and NVIDIA to build that kind of uh, hub around us here, and we're actually building an ecosystem with all the local startup, uh, all the local uh, small and medium uh, companies here. So the idea would be to create jobs, to translate research even more efficiently, to create what we call the Siligong Valley, sorry for, for the pun, that comes from my boss, he really likes that one. And uh, it's all about co-funding projects, so we, we want to co-develop IPs with our partners uh, there. So the, the co-creation uh, and the co-funding of IPs will lead to uh, new um, innovation first, but also new startup, new spin-off, and new jobs, uh, we hope, in the industry, so upskilling the people around us. So just to, to summarize um, a bit of our background and, and journey here, the, the key learning is 
whatever we want to do, it takes a lot of time. So the, the key things is trust and communication. That's uh, the, the key parameters to have a successful research translation. So you have to play uh, with legal ethics and confidentiality when you do research translation. And also you need to get access to data. So that's why trust and communication is important. Um, you need to be quite agile as well because you need to build new things very quickly, but also please do not reinvent the wheel. So that's why we started focusing on using production ready or production grade technology, uh, like the, the NVIDIA Tao that allows us to build prototype, prototypes quickly and scale them up very easily. We also think that uh, found out that university and industry do not uh, move at the same pace. So industry is very quick. They want something done very quickly by the deadlines. Universities, by definition, we usually take a bit more time because we like to explore all the possibilities and we want to make sure that our findings are accurate, etc. But having said that, universities, from my experience, we've been very good partners to, to develop a proof of concept and prototypes, but definitely we need to work uh, with industry partners and startups to commercialize IP. And of course, uh, I've got more things to, to mention uh, later on if you want about the different challenges, but uh, I think it's I'm going to stop here and uh, let uh, William uh, uh, do, do its talk now. Thanks, everyone. OK, thank you very much, Johan. I think it's very interesting presentation. presentation. I will come back and ask you more questions about, about uh, the process that you uh, licensing the IP to start up or the industry to do the real world business. Okay, but next, please move to uh, Williams. But uh, uh, since the session will end at 10.30, so uh, I, I give you like five minutes, is it okay, to introduce yourself and then your research to commercialize journey. So we will have time to discuss in group later. Yeah, let me, let me try. <laughs> I ran through a slide, the slides very fast as I speak, so please catch up. So if you can see my slides. Can um, okay. okay. part of the uh, applied uh, research. Can can you do a uh, can you do full screen? Sorry, any Okay, sorry, there was uh, some other system. Ah, that's interesting. Am I on full screen? Yes, good. So, okay, good. Wow. So, wow. Okay. So we are part of the program. You can see the wheelchair there. We're part of the uh, accelerated program and uh, the autonomy and self-driving is what we do. So we have done a lot of work with NVIDIA uh, using NVIDIA computer on a full-size autonomous bus. So this is all the technology that we do. And we not only do from research, we make sure that the research has a way to actually apply. These are the technologies we actually do it for our Singapore bus transport system. In the next few years, we'll likely see autonomous bus coming forward. All right, so our role is not only into research, we want to make sure that we actually have all the necessary understanding of what the supply chain, uh, various components, cameras, LiDAR, radar, really making a real world application. So it's not pure research, but we want to make sure that it's really practical and really uh, hands-on and, and in, in the world, how how world works. So then, then again, interestingly, back to the world of uh, uh, simulation. So again, we use a lot of and really compute so to make sure that, that we have all the simulation testing online and also on the real world. So these are all the necessary work. I won't go into each one of the details. I'll just give you a bit of a glimpse at how deep the technology that we go into it, autonomous and all this are being powered by AI and all the neural networks. So huge amount of research, huge amount of work that we've done and development of technology. So one thing good is that uh, in 2014, my colleague and a few engineers actually spin up a company called Autonomy. Autonomy uh, in, in about four years was acquired by Delphi, became active. Today, active joint venture with Hyundai and the autonomous unit is called Motiona. Motiona is in, in the full, full hands of uh, joint venture with uh, 
Hyundai in Singapore doing autonomous vehicles. So we're very proud of our engineers and very proud of our researchers coming on to that to make this happen. So a um, couple of millionaires actually come up from our startup. So not only that we look into cars, but we'll also look into how society impact is to be. Right? So we look in big areas, and this is why we want to see how elderly people or wheelchair could actually be automated. And we put a lot of effort to look at design thinking, strategic innovation. Um, actually, we started to test how, how we believe in uh, intelligent mobile uh, mobility. And this is actually my team and the autonomous feature is featured in a video website. Uh, we actually do real real life testing right in National Gallery. So this is actually being powered by NVIDIA Jackson's uh, AGX. So we have another startup, actually part of it is uh, uh, the second startup we went through actually for um, pedestrian, pedestrian uh, mobility in wheelchairs or anything runs on pavements. So again, a huge technology from neural network, how it goes through. So you know that uh, the technology take a long time. So this is not uh, for faint hearted. It takes a lot of process and we really want to make sure that it's from TRL1 all the way to TRL9 and we make an effort that startup happens. So there are many uh, snapshots in how, how things will run through, but I would like to just give a strong part is that the whole thing is about the innovation strategy, how, how lab technology to market, but also how to convince the market to pull technology. And these two part of it is probably one of the biggest fight that we have. Um, technology is always very raw. Market is always very pragmatic, realist, realistic in business, but we need to find that in between. So those are some of the uh, advantage and advantage that I put in highlights. But most importantly, that we need to over, over, overcome all these prevailing winds, having trade off and make sure that the innovation comes together somewhere in the center. So this is where the strategic innovation is very important because we always have two sides of the coin and it will always be that way. The challenge is how to push and pull so that in the center we work. And this is probably the most important part that what we do. So uh, and that is where we, 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 we treasure a lot. In Singapore, uh, we have a very strong intellectual property protection regime. I'm actually on the uh, IP uh, dispute resolution hub, IPOS is actually a government agency. So not only that we make sure that we have licensing of uh, technology, IP protection, and we make sure that we are within the community, fight for each other to make sure that technology is well used, well respected and uh, well licensed. So the rest, uh, we actually work our, our liaison office. So another startup actually we had, uh, this is actually then our deputy prime minister, uh, Kei Chi Hien with our NUS president, I'm standing beside. So we went to autonomous technology from driving and also pedestrian now, we actually go on ships, boats, all right? So we have a startup called BX. And I'm very, very proud that actually when they got, they got grand prize in the Pierce and the one smart hot challenge in uh, 2020, Feature in the newspaper is a true startup that I, I'm part of. I'm part of the team to make it out. And very, 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 very glad that the young people are driving the next generation of autonomous technology. So all in all, all this we, we it's not what we have done only for ourselves. We have to learn and study how Silicon Valley, the birth of it, how Walt Disney came, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Apple come along. So the entire ecosystem is what has been around for a long time. And we take an effort to study all these technology companies, including NVIDIA, Jackson Huang is actually from Stanford. So how we make sure that uh, we create an environment, a university, uh, uh, the backyard of where we call one North equivalent to Palo Alto, come together and make sure that we have startup and young people going on. So all in all, that's actually my quick elevated uh, pitch to all. Good. Thank you very much, Williams. It's also a very good presentation. Okay, so last uh, presenter, Dr. Itikan. Uh, but this time I have a different question for you. So can you, uh, can you share uh, as your role as a technologist and then you work with NVIDIA, what is your role to support the ecosystem in terms of uh, tech partner? Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Tim. I'm going to share, going to share a simple uh, set of slides and also share 
my experience how do i work with the uh, startups uh, as one of the uh, we call developers in nvidia everybody is developer it, it could be 100 billion dollar company or it's uh, you know 100k uh, dollar company all of us all of us actually are developers so we want to focus on developers while i'm going to answer the question that you have i'm just going to have a quick sharing what is nvidia inception program right um i'm not sure whether the slide is coming through it's uh, coming it's coming okay but i'm but trying to put in start talking first okay sure so from uh, the way that nvidia uh, works with actually we have a program called nvidia inception program as part of the program we provide uh, key benefits to startups and like for example startups from NUS, bx for example or all the other uh, startups and uh, autonomy and so forth actually benefited from the program um, so the five key benefits from the program one is uh, they're given a, a discount on all of our gpu hardware that they can buy uh, as part of the inception program second is they can actually have uh, uh, access to nvidia uh experts so in this case it could be uh, our solution architects or our software uh, experts actually come in and give an advice uh, how they can actually develop the software they can actually use all our uh, platforms the software platform hardware platforms so rather than taking a uh, six months for them to do a certain type of implementation they can get it done within a short period of time this is the like next benefit and as actually the, uh, the 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 product matures and becomes much more stable then there is a team which is marketing team will actually help them how they can actually go to market gtm we call it generally and then once the gtm has been established you have uh, pre users who actually can take it and use it then there is a pr team will help in terms of guiding them how they can write a pr a press release and then they can make it available to potential uh, uh, investors vcs and so forth um, so these are just an, uh, an example of benefits they get as part of the inception uh, program uh, just to share with you how you know we have varieties of inception partners who can come in and can join they may be in a robotic space uh, underwater or autonomous vehicle or they in the space of gaming in the space of uh, machine learning in the space of um, you know digital twins for example right and today we have almost uh, actually this slide is slightly old we have about 9000 startups within the nvidia ecosystem all of them getting help from us and they actually write a lot of um, applications right and again it's free you just go and search for nvidia inception program you can actually uh, work on this now these are the benefits that i shared with you uh, how we actually help uh, in in many forms uh, in terms of sharing knowledge have a, a free dli classes which cost you about uh, maybe one thousand to ten thousand dollars we give it away free uh, then uh, we give you uh, access to uh, a lot of our portals information and also dedicated person who can actually work with you to grow your inception uh, uh, strength in terms of technology this is an example of access that we give including we give you a free cloud credits in terms of using gpus right Right. Uh, this caused uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars for nvidia but nvidia is very very passionate and we wanted to help the startups because nvidia itself is a startup was a startup and still is a startup right that's what we believe so that's why we want to really help you and grow we still you know we are only in a billions of, of devices access next we want to go into trillion so we are still a startup i can see william smiling right uh we see so we can have access, uh, we give you access to the VC. So we have a program where we link the grown startup who are mature, they have a good product, they've already gone to market, they have access to the uh, venture capitalists then who actually work with the NVIDIA team. And then we bring them to VC and vice versa, who are VCs interested with the, uh, v, uh, with the startups, we, we bridge them as well. Uh, awareness that's where you can do your marketing part of it you can actually go and pitch uh, we can uh, we give you option for you to come and, and, and pitch in silicon valley uh, in california in our yearly conference and that actually gives you uh, direct market access possibility of vcs uh, from uh, uh, silicon valley right so briefly this is how we assist the startups so that uh, you know our startup benefits from the whole ecosystem but, but, media that we have created and we have close to th uh, 30 40 startups in, in in thailand i assume that can grow like in singapore we have almost a uh, uh, close to uh, 200 startups uh, in, in in the program um so i hope to see more startups in in thailand to join the program and benefit from it
Thank Back you very you, much, Itikan. So in the future, if there is a team from UTC interested to join your program, so please give us some uh, extra credit for you to accept as a fast track. Okay. I'm sure. I mean, uh, UTC is very <laughs> close, uh, close to my heart. I'm sure I'll, you know, I'll get my team member to look, look at it and give you a fast track approval for yeah, you. Yeah, fast track and extra benefit. Two things. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think next, next will be a group discussion. Okay, so I will, uh, I have some question I would like to ask uh, each of you. Maybe start with uh, Dr. Johan. I saw a lot of industry partner in your presentation. And then you mentioned that university is good at making POC, but not good in bringing into the real world. You have to work with industry partner. Can you share your experience on bringing, which state should you engage with industry partner? And what is the benefit pro and con? Or do you have some things that you want to uh, like want because a lot of professor also Enjoy this event, so maybe some tip for them. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the question. It's, it's a good one and a complicated one. Um, so yeah, the, the universities and the researchers we are very good at uh, developing new products or new innovation or let's say prototypes of new products. So that, that's why uh, we've got a lot of different industries coming to, to us and ask us, can you do that? Can you do that? Um, yeah, for sure, we can do it. Just <laughs> give us a bit of money and a bit of time and, and we get there. Um, but we have also limited resources. So uh, the universities are good to, to write, uh, like to build models, to train models and, and deploy the models on a, a few devices. But you, when you want to scale into the millions of devices, um, even thousands of devices, that's not something that we are equipped to do, at least in Australia. Um, so that's where we, we need to, to work with actually um, specialized vendors or the, the industry to make sure that we can work hands to hand. So we, should, we need to make sure that from the beginning, the design is scalable and we can hand over to, to the industry partners and then it will be easy for, for them to grow it. Um, so that's that's been my, my experience so far. But um, one of the challenges there would be also the, to keep trust between the different parties. And, and it can take a lot of time because trust comes, for instance, uh, different agreements that you can have beforehand, like NDAs or making sure you get all the legal uh, agreements. So, uh, the, the sooner you can build that relationship, the better. So the, the first project is always hard. <laughs> That's why I lost a lot of my hair there. But afterwards, um, it, it becomes faster. You can fast track the, the uh, product and, and the POCs later on. Okay, thank you very much for sharing. Okay, next, uh, Williams. I I very impressed that you, I mean, you are uh, ecosystem or the lab that you are working create a lot of startup. Can you can you uh, like share some tip on the IP to commercialize process? And how do you like suggest which commercialization option is good for for like for the projects? For example, like a spin off to become startup or maybe licensing to the existing company. What what is your advice? So I, I think I think it's important to uh, not to be too not to be too fixated with actually commercialization and day one. All right. So so this is why I mentioned is about maintain the two parts of research and market. So researchers always have a problem on um, not able to find market. It's okay. We we take that it is. But what we need to do is from a very strong strong points, for example, a very big topic like robots or, or autonomy, we do as much research as possible, many topics. Then within it, we need to just sit down in the center space of uh, innovation strategy to look, in, look into every single portfolio of technology. We know, we know the work that we do with the themes. We need not only project managers, we, we need people that has a lot of deep understanding, maybe even entrenched in the team. Then from there, we extract those uh, IP 
we will document it through disclosure and we actually file it for patent and file it for protection. And each one of them will sit down and we actually create 10 different solutions, 10, probably even more. And each one of them will, will, will work with uh, the, the, the market people that are these solutions suitable, you know, then you know, we just throw it out. So we, I would like to say that it's a validation process, it's a matchmaking process, but it's about creating a lot, making a lot of solution, and also start to match it with the market and work together. So uh, in, in a way that startup environment is, is do a lot of things. This is why every time I go to Silicon Valley, it's about, it's about two pieces and two beers and, and with the jeans and t-shirt and how we work. So, but also importantly is as we are going to this, to answer your question, we, in Singapore, we, we really, really focus into IP and we really get our researchers to document their work very clearly. So whoever is working on it, the disclosure are clear. So by the time we don't do negotiation, it's much easier, probably because uh, we are using English to, to, to communicate and we run it through. But sometimes it's also difficult because when you're doing experiment, how document it? But uh, I probably want to put a very strong advice is document your work, make it sure that your disclosures are clear. And when we come to negotiation, you can actually see who has much work and from there, the technology, not only from documentation, also from the science and technology explanation, we can find very good fit. So uh, we, we actually, in a way, using the guided principle of intellectual property to help us to do our work. So interestingly, technology management and IP management has a lot of linkage. Okay, thank you very much. Very good tip. Okay, so next one I would like to ask you, uh, Dr. Itikan. Uh, what is the most challenging that you face during uh, research to innovation journey? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a very interesting question, right? I mean, I, I myself as a researcher in the past gone through the cycle. It's what we call the valley of death. It doesn't come once, but comes twice in, uh, in the journey of uh, from a researcher to uh, you know to commercialization uh, me as self you know i have uh, you know published quite a number of papers and patents right um, it's nice to write papers fantastic uh, that's what my boss used to tell in my, my previous organization i used to work for a, a company and then we, we are r&d lab but uh, you know i mean there's no uh, you know I'm, I'm i'm not saying anything about publishing papers is a fantastic very important as a journey uh, to claim eventually to become a professor but in uh, in industry in the lab uh, they don't really care about papers. Uh, they care a lot about patents. That's William and mentioned, right? It is about can I make money or uh, uh, you know about each patent that I have. And I used to have uh, a KPI of three patent has to be accepted in a year. And me and my engineers. So the failure rate is seventy percent, right? So we know by by default I'm going to fail seventy percent. So that means in order to have three accepted, I need to have uh, nine. Uh, in most of the times, uh, you know, nine is not enough. That means you need to have 12. So that means every month we have to make sure we have to draft a patent draft. We do drafting of patent by ourselves because we don't trust the lawyers who can draft, draft because they will miss all the most important uh, uh, key sub claims which goes into the cycle. So that was my life for almost the six years, just writing patents and uh, the KPI to achieve. So for companies, patents are so important because when we go, there is a litigation process. Uh, if, we, uh, if our patents are being, uh, for example, being litigated, that means people saying they're going to sue us because there's a, a claim in the patent. So we are the happiest person in the world because somebody's right reading your patent, right? Somebody says you are infringing somewhere, somehow. So the journey is tough. The first journey is the value of death is whether your patent is unique or your invention is unique in any forms, right? As simple as your Python code is whatever it is, all right? That's fine. So that's the invention stage. The next value of that is, okay, having the first one is people look at your code, look at your application, want to use it. They want to have your IP. That's the first. If you can hit the rate, you have passed the first value of death. Next value of death is commercialization. 
Yeah, I mean, I have, I used to work with colleagues and then they have like a few hundred patents under in their pocket, right? And then we used to call them, ah, a few hundred is okay because the other guy has 1,000 patent under his name, right? So it's not the 1,000 few hundred is important, but end of the day, how much royalty do you get from the patent that you actually put in? And the royalty only comes in if the product goes to market. From the uh, the innovation where your patent is accepted, I'm just looking at a patent perspective. The next is whether can you make a successful product, hmm. right? And the product is successful is one, but can they sell the product? So for the companies, that is another challenge. Is your invention is so great and usable that people are going to buy millions of units or thousands of units, right? So there's a true value of that. So putting back into researchers in the university, your, your, you have published the papers, it's fantastic, good work. You share the knowledge to everybody. But if you intend to drive Ferrari, like, you know, like William may be driving because uh, some of them has gone into the commercialization of autonomy, right? So then you got to protect with IP because when you go and sell your IP, published papers is not anymore considered as a IP, right? It's, it's open information. It's everybody's going to have it. You got to protect it. Next, can you make a prototype? and make the prototype into a platform. And that platform must be scalable. People don't anymore look at anymore uh, 100,000. Yeah, maybe one is good. People are looking about 1 million users using it, right? And it's okay, you can be Amazon. The next 10 years, you can be in, in, in debt because after that, you're going to make all the money after that, right? So today, if you look at it, it is not anymore uh, a product. It's all becoming a platform, right? A, a platform to serve many people. So the next value of that, that the, the, the research work has to traverse through is how do you bring your research excellence into a platform? Uh, you call it as a product, uh, you call it as a software, which is usable, likable, and scalable, the next value of death. Again, I think uh, many researchers have, have told only 1% of 99 uh, people will succeed in the journey. So the only way it is reverse engineer, don't do one time, just do thousand times. So the percentage of success rate is much higher, as simple as that, like what William shared. Don't start one startup, do 10 startup, uh, nine will die, one will succeed, that one will give you 100 million and you can buy a Ferrari, you can write. That's the... Uh, that's my sharing. Thank you very that's, much. That's live, in, that's live in research and that's live in, uh, in translation. It's not only Exactly. One. It's not it's, one. Go for 100, a go for 1,000. Yes, we have success rate of, yeah. Okay. So fail, fail is, is common. It's by default. No, not it's common. common. It's by default. By default. You must accept it's by default. Okay. Mm -hmm. but Without you doing anything, you already fail. You fail, failure. And then yeah. you start a new one, better. And okay. don't do don't do serial, do parallel, no. like a GPS. Ah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> we do, do. So, okay. so it's not about it's not about one fail, one succeed. It's about everything go, and there's only a few who make it. Mm, okay. So this is the question that I would like to ask you, uh, Itikan. Uh, I think the process, research to commercialize process, is very long journey. And and I think a professor because we are talking about deep tech entrepreneurs and most of them come from the university. Uh, I'm not sure uh, outside Thailand, but in Thailand case, I think because the place where a lot of researcher uh, works is in the university. So how can they like manage uh, professor works while still pursuing their dream to make a deep tech spin-off, for example, what is your suggestion on this? Should they like work with the partners or should they build their own uh, staff or people? Should they talk to the investor? Can you share some tips? Or I'll anyone share, can, can, yeah. can share. I'll share, then I'll get probably William and also uh, Johan to chip in, right? So uh, I, I, I I mean, after my PhD, I spent about uh, close nine months only in the university. Then I decided I don't think so I will last in university. So I left to industry uh, to do uh, research work mostly, right? Um, and the best thing is what, what one of the work that I, I've been doing with my lab partners in US is um, you don't do prototype. You don't do a product development. You start with marketing. You have three months to fail on idea. You start with a concept and idea, go and sell it. 
and see whether anybody is going to buy the idea and you get the money, right? And today I tell you, it's easy to get investor money. I just spoke to some of the VCs uh, last week and they said the money is easily, you can get between uh, $10,000 to $100,000. You just need to have a good set of marketing slide to pitch your idea. People are ready to put in money. This is what you call the new goal money. Old goal, new goal. New goal is the money is ready. So the, the challenge is can the uh, you know, professors go in and, and sell the idea, pitch. And uh, this is why, like Williams shared, right? It's, it's a glass of beer or a glass of uh, a chai or whatever it is. You sit and talk and you sell. Uh, so that's the most important first journey. Can you sell your idea, get investment in? Whether it's a grant money, whether it is uh, the big conglomerate who can just give away some money or it is from an uh, investor who's coming in, that's a selling. Uh, William, you may want to add on, William. So I agree with Adikin. So once, uh, once the researcher, the PR, we call the principal investigator invented, uh, once the, the initial idea is being sold, uh, I think the next part is really to build a team, to build a team to really make the rest of the thing happening. And likely the researcher, the key professor will be a CTO and they will net the rest of the stuff to be done because the focus on technology will continue to be very strong. But there's many other things that come along. You know, there's a lot of marketing, there's a lot of finance, a lot of fundraising and all this stuff. So uh, I always, in part of my uh, teaching, I, I teach part-time my master's program. So we got this CEO, CTO, COO, CFO and CMO, chief marketing officers chief financial officer. So you need to build a team. So likely, likely scenario is that professor will continue to be a CTO role, but I, uh, some might make it a CEO, but CTO is better. And you build your team, whether it's gonna be young students or your PhD graduates within your team, uh, you, you enable them, you work it through. So uh, that is what is also important as part of research translation. Research translation also includes the human capital translation. It's likely the professor will continue to be in university. Johan, maybe you want to share from your experience, Johan. Um, uh, well, I don't have much to, to add because I think that's very good uh, uh, points there. Uh, I think that the key is to get the right people around you and also being good at time management because <laughs> it can be hard to um, balance between universities and research if you are still passionate about it. And also research translation, both can take a lot of your time. But the key is yeah, having the, the right people next to you to, to help you. Yeah, as a most of the time, I won't say there is no life and work. It's only work. <laughs> That's fine. <my point. laughs> well, because we had chosen this career, um, work is actually our life. So two pieces and two beers, that is how we live. Exactly. <laughs> but it is very fulfilling in the journey and it's exciting. That's right. So, yeah. mm, okay. Okay, I think we have two minutes left. So maybe one last question. So uh, maybe I, I would like to ask uh, Williams as Singapore is next to Thailand. So what is, uh, I think software is a bit difficult to patent in Thailand. Do you have some tip to overcome this challenge? Especially, I mean, AIs and algorithms things in Thailand is a bit difficult, but I'm not sure in, in Singapore. Um, you know very well, NUS and Chua Long Kong actually have an MOU together. So, so um, uh, I, I, think, I think, again, the world is very globalized. Uh, we, should, we should start to learn how to work together, all right? It's, it's not about trying to build everything together. If you look at Silicon Valley, it's not about, actually in some sense that Silicon Valley is not about Americans themselves, all right? You've got huge amount of talents from China, India, and everywhere else is part of that. So once we appreciate that the ecosystem is more than that. So I'm quite sure that Singapore and Thailand can come together. See, Thailand has the most, the, most, the biggest automotive industry in this part of the world. I really want to see how could Thailand and Singapore come together with my autonomous technology, with your best way of building cars. We can come together as local people and together with global team, come with as autonomous vehicles. So that's my strong belief. So let's work towards it. So thank you very much. So I think it's our time is up for this session. So before uh, we leave, can we uh, take a photo? and the group photo, four of us. Okay, smile.
Okay, so thank you very much for joining our session. Hope to see you again and hope you can join our event next time. So thank you, uh, Dr. Johannes Williams and Itikan. So have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.